everyone. My name is Bonita. I am the board coordinator for Permaculture Association of the Northeast, and I'm just so delighted to have all of you here with us this evening, and especially to have Monica Ibacache as our guest. And I'm coming to you in a place that we call Perth, Ontario, which is unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin territory, and PAN, Permaculture Association of the Northeast, hails to you from the traditional territory. Well, our official home base is Western Massachusetts and we're on the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq, the Pocumtok and the Wampanoag peoples. And to me, I think just a quick word about land acknowledgements. So I think probably more of us are used to, to hearing this at the beginning of, of gatherings. And to me, this is more than just a box to check. I was in a, I was listening to a webinar earlier today, and what I really appreciated, when they talked about, they were talking about the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, and and fair share, and they they talked about, they said that care is more than, care is more than just our, our taking care of something, it's also about our responsibility, and it's also about justice, and so to me, our land acknowledgements are a small part of that. Our land acknowledgements are about really honoring the peoples who have who come before us, who have been the traditional care keeper, care caregivers, caretakers of the lands that we live on for for generations and and continue to do so. So I am just again so thrilled to to welcome Monica Bacache to our to our session this evening and I will pass it over to you Monica to to lead us in a little a little visioning exercise hi everyone I'm so happy to be here with you all thank you so much for being here so I wanted us to do a little exercise I want you to I would I, I invite you to think about a dream garden or farm. Think about it, what does it look like? And then we're gonna just take a couple of minutes for this. So whatever your list of what you would have on it is, then just put it in the chat. Whatever you see in your dream, is that what you're saying, Monica? Yeah, yeah. What do you visualize when you think about your dream farm or garden? I do this exercise with my students when we start the class the first day. I invite them to dream about to what would their dream garden and farm look like or farm look like. And then I ask them to write a list. Get them thinking before we've ever even talked about what permaculture is. Nice. I'm reading what you're saying. This is great. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, I can tell I'm 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 speaking to I'm speaking to the choir here. I'm preaching to the choir. This is great. For those of us, for those who have just joined, we are, um, we are doing the first, hold on one second. This is what we're doing right now. And I will make it big. Okay. 
And Bonita, I will let you keep track of the time if possible, please. Okay, of course. All right, so Carrie, you've got lots of, ooh, I wanna live on your farm. <laughs> lots of berries and fruits and Marcos has got, yeah, for sure, Roberta. I'm all for the critters thriving. I, I like to tell my students, you know, we design for all. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We design for all. So we've just got another minute for the exercise. Oh, wonderful. Mm hmm. So, Monica, whenever you're ready, I think I would love for you to take us through a little a little deep a little deep dive a deep dive <laughs> into your your world into your story into your your beautiful work wonderful wonderful so generally when I start a course with um with new students who've never heard of permaculture the first thing that I want them to do is design I learned from my mentor Dave Jackie everyone's a designer we all design our lives every day. So what we're gonna learn here in this course is about a particular kind of design, permaculture design. And this is important, it's an important frame and it's an important, um, it's an important frame and um, just trying to see how to, okay. It's an important frame when you're working with people sometimes, Something I'm very conscious of is that everyone, not everyone might have a good identity as a learner. And it's really important for me to enroll them and bring them in and give them a feeling of being able to be free to express and create. So with that said, um, doing this exercise is a really, it's a wonderful entry point. Uh, into the world of teaching permaculture. And when I say youth, I mean all children, all from K, really, all, honestly, from pre-K all the way to 24. <laughs> Those are really big kids. 22-year-olds are big kids. All right, great. So let's go ahead and go into... So thank you all for sharing your gardens. Uh, they look absolutely... Gardens and farms, they look really beautiful. And... Um, let me go into the slideshow. So today I wanted to talk about teaching permaculture to youth and designing for the future. We did our exercise. I wanted to tell you a little bit about me. This is me. I was born in Chile in the 70s and that's my little brother. And this is the view from my grandpa's house. It was built right after I was born. So we moved in. Uh, I'm, as you can see, I'm from the coast. We're surrounded by eucalyptus forests. It's a temperate forest. It's really beautiful. It rains about half the year. So our version of winter is cold and windy, overcast. And then I actually learned how to garden in Alaska. I was living in Alaska as an adult and I knew I was going to come back to New York City. And um, I had took the opportunity to learn how to garden and that opened up the vortex. <laughs> I know it was in my early 30s, so the vortex opened for some later in life. 
so after I got to, I came to, after I came back to New York City, I got into permaculture and I took a PDC in New York City. Um, I was hooked, hooked, hooked. So then I decided to, I had the opportunity to go to do Dave Jackie's permaculture teacher training. And then I went and did this year long internship, growing season internship at a yoga ashram where I got to practice all my skills of teaching. And I got, I was so excited. And I'm per, I like to say I'm, per, I'm permaculture fire. And I started enrolling people to come back and work with me. So all of these people, Mina, Sarah, Susan, and this whole crew, they had all come as weekend guests. <laughs> and then they came back to work with me in the garden. It was really exciting and it was really fun. And I got to learn how to do permaculture in 45 minutes, teaching skills and concepts as we worked. It was, it was a wonderful experience for me to learn how to teach that way. And then, ha ha ha, one of the best things that happened while I was at the ashram was I got to meet this lovely young woman named Cassandra. Back then I called her Cassie. Sometimes I still do. This is a picture. This is me in the black shirt. This is Cassie with the long hair. And that's our friend, Brendan. We are working on a compost pit, a compost pile at the ashram garden was almost an acre. And then later in life, 10 years later, here is Cassandra now grown, went from 14 and 24, and she is a teacher with me at Beyond Organic Design. Pretty cool. You'll be hearing from her in a little bit. So how did I get to this? What happened? So I came, you know, I grew up in the southeast of the United States, you know, moved to New York City as an adult. I took 10 years out, went to Alaska and was based out of Alaska where I learned to fall in love with nature again because I was living in a national park. I knew I was going to come back to New York. And then, you know, some things had changed by the time I came back. I'd become an auntie. And um, now I'm an auntie to seven, soon to be eight. And my nieces and nephews are really important to me. And I started wondering what kind of world they were going to inherit. And it was scaring me a bit. And here's some pictures of them when they were little. 10. Look at Micah now. He's ginormous. My God, these kids. And Anaya's little in this one. And look at her. She's taller than me. Well, I'm 5'2". It's not that hard to be taller than me. But still, look, they're ginormous. And that idea of what are they going to inherit was really impacting me. So when I came back to New York City after the ashram in 2010, I decided that I needed to do something. So what did I do? I just started to teach children and I started with preschool and I did that for three years, preschool and after school and like summer camp, but it was more gardening. It wasn't quite permaculture. So then I did that for a number of years and just learned how to teach because I'm self-taught that way. And, um, and then I moved into teaching permaculture when I developed a relationship with the school in Queens. They had me, I started with them in 2014 and then until now at Renaissance Charter School. So at this school, we developed, I developed the Urban Design and Sustainability Program. And then the, here's some of the things that we do, design, permaculture design. We've got, um, we're teaching um, design and build. We were building a birdhouse. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear the honking, but I'm definitely in New York City. And then we have them gardening. Uh, actually, this young man just turned back and just uh, was in my course again. Now he's in high school, which was really fun. I also began the high school programs, programming, doing uh, week-long intensives, doing um, the internship program, which is once a week. And that's a little bit of what I'm doing now. I have a permaculture design lab with high school students. So here's some pictures of me working with the kids and um, having them present. In this picture, Tiana has on a bear costume. It was Halloween. That is what she's wearing. She was really cute and very fun. And 
And then for me in 2022, I joined the permaculture faculty uh, to do online PDCs at Oregon State and Cornell University. As I've been part of this movement since 2007, I volunteered at many, many points and some of the places that I'm volunteering with now, uh, places that uh, organizations that are doing really important work in the world is our professional trade association, Permaculture Institute of North America, and then Abundant Earth Foundation who are doing amazing work internationally and nationally of uh, supporting local grassroots efforts. And then the Northeast Biogas Council who are doing Northeast Biogas Initiative who are doing uh, really wonderful work um, spreading the word of biogas. I def I highly recommend that you check out all of them. I am not going to play this, but I wanted you all to see it. This is a uh, wasteland to paradise. It's about the gorilla gardeners who founded Smiling Hogshead Ranch in Queens. It's a video of um made by Andrew Millison of Oregon State University. And I took him there and this is a farm that's in the middle of a, all the green that you see is a farm, urban farm in the middle of railroad, railroad yard, surrounded by railroad yards. It's absolutely amazing. It's in Long Island City. Oh, when I got, oh, when I got sorry. in touch with my friend, Monica, and I was like, I'm coming to New York City. Did not Where's mean to do that. Place? Welcome to New York, Andrew. We have <laughs> got to go smiling hot just one of the best I was trying to spare you in New York City you'll see for yourself I was trying to spare you y'all but it looks like that did not this happen it was a trash dump and Hold it was bioremediated it's very fun Compost. and it is definitely worth watching so I'm going to get out of that and move on to yeah <laughs> awesome so that's a little bit about me. I went through it pretty quickly. I, um, I'm hoping that you all have questions and um, about it, and I'm happy to expound. One of the things that I just want to put up front is I am very much someone who has been in the work, like in the classrooms, in the gardens, teaching, mentoring, creating. So this is a little bit newer for me to be talking about the work. And uh, I'm I'm happy to have this opportunity. I just want to say thank you, Bonita, and thank you to Pan for having me. And um, yeah, mostly what I would say is that coming to permaculture was a pivotal moment for me. It integrated all of these dis what felt like were disparate parts of me, and made them make sense. And for me, it was something that still to this day, I feel hopeful and empowered and like there's a path forward. And that's a lot of what I wanna to bring to my youth. And, and that is what it was given to me. And that is what is behind the work that I do with them. So, all right, Miss Bonita. Thank you, Monica. So just to let folks know what we're doing is I'm going to, I'm actually, I'm going to interview Monica and Cassandra for, for a few minutes. And I would love to, so Monica, tell me, I, I just help us, help us get into your shoes. And so tell me about a moment with a student that you will always remember. You know, like the, the work that you do, I'm sure there are days where you're just extremely frustrated with the bureaucracy where maybe you know maybe you're feeling disheartened with the state of the world so even if you're having a bad day tell me about just a beautiful sweet inspiring moment that you had with a student that always stays with you hmm. you know Cap Cassandra uh Cassie and I were talking about this I was I was I said because I, I asked her this question and um, the moments that stand out the most for me are moments where my very New York City students are getting exposed to things and then through that exposure, that awareness, they become not afraid of them. Mm. So 
when Emily was like, I used to think worms were disgusting and now I think they're really cool and kind of cute because we have a worm compost bin. Or I would have another <laughs> I would have another child, Sarah, saying, Monica, I was really scared of bees and I didn't know how important they are. Because a lot of the children that we teach, Cassandra, Cassandra has taught with me preschool, after school, and summer camp. She also came a couple of days for my high school internship. So she's been there the whole time. And children, you know, the ways that they express things are very different depending on the ages. So the younger ones, I I really would take those things to heart. Mm. And when I worked with the older ones, the middle school students, I think with no matter who I work with, what's really important to me is that they have that it be experiential, that it be hands-on, and that it be something that is a positive learning experience for them. I grew up and I grew up surrounded by people that I that I loved that were having very difficult times in school and they didn't feel very confident in themselves as a learner. So a lot of my programming is set up so that they do. So, and the reason why I say that is because one of the learners that always stands out for me is um Juan. He came to me in a one week intensive that I did. And he was having a rough week. I didn't really understand what was happening with him, but I could tell that he was listening sometimes and that he was quick and he had good ideas. So I would call on him, but something else was going on. And then one day he like most 11, 12 year olds forgot his field trip paper and mm -hmm. I had to call his mom and, um, when I did, I just said, you know, I really want Juan to come to this field trip with us. I think he's really going to like it. We're going to a green roof farm, big one, the biggest one in New York City. It's huge at the time. And and I said, Juan's a really good thinker. He's a really quick problem solver. You know, from what I've seen, people who have brains like this tend to go into engineering. That's just what I've noticed. And she was like, oh, thank you, thank you. And he looked a little surprised. And later I found out that Juan actually had a really difficult time in school. I didn't know any of this. And that he had learning differences. And that he hadn't, just stereotypically, just typically didn't have a very good sense of himself in that way. He signed up for my summer camp. We had an amazing time. He was really helpful. He did all kinds of really cool things with me. The next year, my wonderful friend, Ariel Sachs, was his teacher. Um, he evolved a lot as a learner, as a reader, as a writer. She did great work with him. And then, you know, I was just happy for him overall. I And, and you know, Ariel would say to me, it helped what you did. It helped. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that we oftentimes forget that we are a step in each other's lives on the path, like we're a step mm -hmm. on the path for each other and that we can help make the path more easeful. Mm -hmm. Years, uh, a couple of years after that, I saw him in the halls of the high school and he told me, he was saying, hi, give me a hug. And then he said, hey, I gotta go. I was like, all right, dude, see you later. And he's like, yeah, I gotta go to uh, Young Engineers. Oh, wow. So in oh high school, gosh. he went to Young Engineers. Wow. I know. I Apparently, the reason why he had been having such a hard time when he was 12 was because he had difficulties reading and kids would tease him. And a lot of the work that we do in my camp, and Cassie knows this, we're having them design, we're having them build, we're having them garden, we're having them think and problem solve and draw and all of these things that he was able to do because it wasn't just read and write. Mm. And I think that while reading and writing is very important, it's also important to diversify the ways that we give information to children mm -hmm. and adults, really. But Cassie, would you, did you want to add something to that from what you saw? Um, yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, Cassie. Glad hi. to meet you. <laughs> um, for those of you who missed it, I learned how to garden went with Monica when I was 14, and then I went to work for her after college, and now I work full-time in this industry for basically my whole career. Um, and um, I, I agree with what Monica's saying. I think we, we 
would often do things uh, after school or in the summer. So we're extracurricular. Um, and so you can't always see the, um, you know, the fruits of our labor, but I just always viewed it as planting the seeds. And even now in my work, it's always planting the seeds because this is never, you know, the center of what someone's doing. It's not their primary subjects, um, but just that we're, we're making them more informed, you know, human beings on this, on this planet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But I would say in a specific example is I love doing an activity with the preschoolers um, where I would put, uh, I would take a le leaves off the plant and tape them and have, you know, some little cute, you know, clue inside and they'd have to go and find that plant in the garden and then bring oh. it to it and say like, this is the, the leaf in my pamphlet is the leaf on this plant. And that was really rewarding because when kids first start out, it doesn't matter what age they are, if they are not exposed, everything smells like mint and all green things look the same. Um, so to have them be able to start to identify and get excited about it was really rewarding. Oh, I love that so much. And Cassandra, do you, do you, what's your earliest memory of being in the garden with Monica? Like, do you have a moment kind of a sweet moment that you go back to like, oh, the first time that, you know, that she made me touch compost and I was freaked out by the worms or I don't know, like do you have a something. I think that, um, I think I remember the compost because that's the only thing we have a picture of. So we talk about it some, sometimes, but um, I remember her pointing out um, the comfrey I think it was and saying like you can chop this down and lay it down as mulch and um I just liked being around her and so I would just go to kind of hang out with her um and then the compost pile if you notice in that picture I'm in a skirt and clogs <laughs> so I was not prepared for that type of work but I was game to to have fun and we were making a compost lasagna so that's where I first learned about you know, it was probably one of my first introductions to carbon and, you know, how things combine and decompose. Yeah. Yeah, Cassie oh. uh, was a was on her summer break and she would ride her bicycle up the hill to where I was doing my internship to work with me in the garden. And it was just fun, fun mm -hmm. to have her. I was always really happy to see her. Mm. and she was so curious about everything so like I said she was another willing student mm. and then Cassie and I stayed friends on Facebook and when she went to college we were still chatting well, I would cheer her on and then when she graduated from college she moved to New York City and then she started working with me mm. it was awesome I love that so much I'm sure so many kids have been touched by by their time with you and by their time in this program or in these programs. So and so I have this this question is for both of you and Monica, I'm so tell me about an aha moment for for some of these kids. You know, like when these when a child realizes that so not only are they learning about plants and learning about soil, but through this way of interacting with this world, through this way of thinking that they can actually make a difference in their neighborhoods, that they can make a difference in their communities. And I'm wondering also, Cassandra, if you can remember that moment for yourself as well, too, like when, you know, when it went from this interesting, oh, I'm just learning about, you know, green things and food and growing things from seeds to, oh, wow, actually, I can make a difference with this. You know, it's interesting. I can think of a lot, but because I believe that um, I want to just, uh, I want to see, I think um, my friend Karin is here because I have this great, great memory. There she is. She's here. I have this great memory. Karin Olson Ramanujan, for those of you all who don't know her, is an amazing educator and designer and entrepreneur. She has a company called Regenerpreneur. So I definitely recommend you to check it out. Karin came to teach with me for a week. And um, it was just, she was amazing. And the kids absolutely loved her. But 
One of the parents came to tell me how his child had come home so excited about compost and how it was making a big difference in the world what they were doing. Mm. And I, I, I loved it. It was so amazing. And it was Karin. Karin got him super jazzed. And it just, his, his dad was like, he's so excited, Monica, about it. He's so excited about how this makes things better. Mm. And I think that that's a big thing. I can think of a million examples. And I use that one because Karin's here and I wanted to give her a shout out. But uh, I can think of many examples like that where I would hear from the children and the parents mm. that the kids were really inspired and empowered by what they were learning. Mm. And I, I think that in those moments when I'm not sure what, like, I'm not sure that helps. Cassie, did you have anything? Um, yeah, I was thinking about Benita's questions. Like, when did I realize it could make an impact? I'm not sure. I can't pinpoint that moment because I've kind of been doing it for a while, but I know recently, um, I started as the farm manager for a farm program for a small liberal arts college and taking over a new site and being responsible for it. And the permaculture principles have really guided me. Um, and in just seeing how much of a difference design can make and working with other people that really want to, you know, just get something done really quick. And I'm thinking, small and slow solutions, you know, observe and interact, you know, you have to take your time with things. So I think all of the the concepts of permaculture are things that really simmer and you can kind of return to again and again and again. Mm. And I'm curious for, for you, Cassandra, because it, this journey with Monica came into your life while you were in school. So for you as a young person, those the the lessons kind of naturally got integrated into your life into into what you you know maybe were already learning in biology class or in other classes maybe in geography or social studies do you, how did that how did that shape how did that shape your learning as a young person and and was that was that very different for friends of yours that didn't go through the program um yeah i think um for me as as an educator and as someone who was educated in this um the growth process is really subtle mm -hmm. so for me it was just about now being more drawn to um nature and plants and having that be more accessible for me. I didn't, my, my parents didn't grow things. We didn't have house plants, things like that. Um, and so it just made it more approachable to engage in those topics. And then slowly over time, you know, it became a, a bigger part of my life. Mm. I love just the idea of imagining you as at the age of 14 and then how you know just at the, planting that little seed or Monica being part of that little seed being planted in your life and how it's become such a central part of of your life and and your work in the world so I would love to just transition a little bit and have the two of you talk a little bit about the your big vision for bringing permaculture design into every public school across the country so why you know what is the potential for this and yeah monica t just tell me about this vision that you have you've been doing this work for a decade and it's easy to get tired it's easy to get discouraged and actually you're 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 not you're not backing away from it you're actually digging in further and saying let's do more of this let's let's really expand this so tell me about your vision and, and why, why you think this is so important. Um, there was a really loud honking out here. So I kept muting myself. Um, so 
having done this work for since 2010 and having um having seen the impact on students and educators and administrators and getting the just really positive feedback and consistent this is helping this is good work this is important thank you for doing this i started and then the the um, the pandemic happened so in fall of 2019 i was teaching what was going to be the first permaculture design course taught in a public school um in the nation and then the pandemic happened march of 2020 and our course stopped 6 months in so i learned a lot during that time and through since from that and then it's taken a while for things to get back we just got back into a high school because things have been you know just in recovery mode but what i realized the reason why i want to get it why it came to me um, i wanted i always wanted to get into every high school every school in the nation but it was the pandemic that really did it because up until that point, I was doing it with the help of Cassie, with the help of Kayla, with the help of others, other uh, past, current and past staff. And, um, but then that stopped us dead. And I just said, you know, Cassie at that time, she left New York City, Kayla left New York City. A lot of my staff people, Kayla's also on this call, left New York City. And I understood, and cause we're all in a standstill. And I said, this is really important. How am I going to move this forward? And then I'm like, I need to write it up. I need to write it up as lesson plans that public school teachers can understand, teachers can understand, and um, and and package it in a way and align it to standards and make it replicable. replicable. I need to take my programming and make it and transform it into curriculum that they understand. And because I've spent so much time working in public schools, I actually know what they're looking for. That is what gave me the added confidence to say, I know how to do this. I've learned how to do this. Now it's time to write it up and, and then get it out to all of the teachers and all of the administrators. There are so many, um, what I've learned is that administrators and teachers, and this might be redundant, they love these kids. They love these children. They love their students and they want the best for them. And there's some uh, many very progressive ones who are looking for this kind of programming, but it doesn't exist. Right. I've been doing it. A couple people like Richard Daly's here, like a couple people have been doing it. Hey, <laughs> good to see you. And a couple people have been doing it, but I want to do it in a bigger way. So my big vision is to do a, a big curriculum project where with the help of writers, graphic designers, um, at some point marketers, we're going to create this um the we're going to take what I've already created and we're going to transform into public school curriculum and then we're going to get it out to all of the schools and then the other piece that I wanted to say about that is that teachers know how to teach they know how to do concepts they know how to manage classrooms they're just missing the curriculum and they can run with it Cassie did you have some thoughts about that yeah, I, um, I've i never gotten the opportunity to teach permaculture to high school. I think a lot of what, perma, a lot of the permaculture concepts are very high level thinking skills. And so a lot of the, um, the work of teaching it to preschoolers or third graders or eighth graders is breaking it down. Um, but high school is when they start to get to an age where they can fully digest the concepts as is and really start to apply them in meaningful ways and so that's that's where i see the benefit of um pushing this in a in high school settings 
So one of uh, uh, part of my vision is that um, to create a permaculture design course for high schools. So right now the permaculture design course is 72 hours. So what I'm looking at is filling the entire school year, which is 130 hours, which is great because then you can put in climate primer, you can put in lots of design practice, you can put in um, more about social permaculture, civic action, how change is made. You can do a lot more, but it has to be broken down into these 40 minute chunks, which is Bonita, you've taught PDCs. That is Karn's top PDC because Michael Burns is on here. Like there are enough people who know that the way that we teach permaculture is not in 40 minute modules. So the, the work of making it into a form that will work for a 180 day school year is quite a project in itself. Check. And so just to, to dovetail off of that, how is it different? How do you make the concepts more digestible to a young person? How do you, yeah, how, how is it, how does it look different from a PDC to adults? And how do you capture the, how do you capture and keep the interest and the imagination of young people as you're, as you're introducing them to something that can be so new to some of them? Like, you know, and whether it's the practical well, piece of you're... getting their hands in the soil or whether it's actually the kind of a more holistic way of, of seeing the world. Hey, and I see Michael I, has. I, yeah, do you see that? Hand raised. Michael's a high school, mm -hmm. he's a public school teacher. He knows, and he's also taught. Hey, Howdy. Michael. Yeah, yeah, I just, I, I can only speak to my very specific experience of teaching permaculture to high schoolers. I was very lucky to be in a very progressive minded public charter school teaching seniors. And so that, you know, mentioning about teaching the upper level high school students, it is very exciting because they're grasping concepts really fast. Um, it's a great, well, I'm biased. I was a high school teachers of junior and seniors, but I think it's the best age to teach. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Just on a more practical element, I my course was part of their economics course senior year. So I now and also what's specific to my experience was I was allowed to create my dream economics course. The, the type of principle I had. So it wasn't always clear to the kids whether they were in economics or were they in the permaculture track? And so when we finally got to do our four day intensive out at my farm, you know, that was about 20 hours there. They were on fire. It almost wasn't fair. It's one of my fondest memories of teaching permaculture by a long shot. But the, on the practical level, what Monica was talking about, picking a, or a curriculum or a few, and being able to attach it directly or just in terms of being part of their a, a student semester or year long course. Um, it helps because they're, they're learning concepts so fast. And so when the idea of uh, small, slow solutions, for example, someone mentioned earlier, when you can demonstrate how that works in micro or macroeconomics and then you turn around and you discuss it as an ecological principle in their permaculture class, they're just like bing, 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 going off in their heads. And I still, some of those now young adults, I still see a lot of them. And uh, that's hard to recreate. That's why I'm signing on to this Zoom session was because I knew Monica is on to a, a, a fascinating program and I'm, I'm more of a spectator now. But yeah, attach it to a curriculum for high school. And also remember, these kids aren't thinking about getting homesteads or starting a business. Mm -hmm. They don't have that mm -hmm. economic edge um, that adults do. So instead, their sense of fairness, yep. their desire mm -hmm. for a great future, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, 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 well, high school teachers know. I'll leave yeah. it at that.
Thank you, Michael. Michael. I really appreciate that. You're an awesome. I would actually like. Go ahead. I, I would love to take this opportunity just to open the, the floor to questions from other folks. Sure. And I think uh, Lori has her hand up. Maybe other people do too. I can't. I'm just seeing what's on my screen. Hi, Lori. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. I've been thinking a lot. I was fourth generation New York City and suburbs. I did oh, have wow. the benefit of going to camp for two years and I'm 70 now. And I'm very, very involved with permaculture. And some people are doing permaculture, young people who I inspired. But I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart, because I've been thinking so much that in New York City, I wasn't exposed to any of this. And I was just on a four hour webinar. I don't know the exact name, but it's doctors doing lifestyle medicine. I've always been involved for 40 years of food as medicine and the School for Food and Policy. And so all of this, and Alice Waters has that website with the Edible School Garden. Yeah. So you breaking it up into these, I just wanted to thank you as a gray hair because for 40 years I testified, I wish I had known of this 40 years ago, I testified against nuclear and GMOs and I got nowhere. My friend put up a hoop house. She was an adjunct at a college. She wanted to have um, edible plants in planters all over the campus because people in New York City and elsewhere are so detached from what creates health and our medicines. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, you made my heart very happy. And I'll... Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. My two questions have to do with funding and bioremediation. I'll let others speak. Uh, because even a friend of mine in New York City, he said, sometimes they bring soil into the community gardens, but he's noticed that there's sometimes lead in between where they're growing, where children are playing. And I never quite know how to answer those questions. I was also this summer at the Waterfall Unity Alliance in the Skehari Valley, the Mohawk got 50 acres back of a berry and apple orchard, a berry farm, and they're, they're spreading biochar and Indian, a certain okay. microbes. So Great. I would like to see more written on that. So when people ask questions, I know where to refer them. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the gardening that I do, the way that I'm the way that I'm teaching permaculture is I'm working with uh, schools who already have gardeners, already have gardens and it's container gardens. We're not gardening in the soil. That's one. Um, and my understanding um, from talking to other people who do garden in the soil, they know they bring in soil in in bags and other means. Um, so, and actually that video that you showed before in the intro, that speaks a lot to that. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a good one. And that's an urban farm. Um, they do a lot of bioremediation, but I talk about bioremediation and biochar because the way that, uh, to go back to what Bonita had said originally asked originally was how do you teach this to kids? So I loved Michael's example because you know permaculture is so flexible. But the way that I've been doing it is there's a lot of climate anxiety among amongst youth. And the way that I've been, the way I do it is I address it. I'm like, anybody notice any of this stuff going on? Anybody? Everybody's gonna say yes. Um, do you understand why it's happening or? if there's anything that we can do about it, if anybody's doing anything about it or any of these kinds of questions. And, you know, usually the answer is no. And I'm like, well, let's talk about it. Let's see, let's see what we can learn. And then, you know, it's kind of a meandering walk through answering questions and giving information and starting with the problem is climate chaos. One of the solutions is permaculture design and its toolbox. Because when we learn how to design, we open up our toolbox and start to pull out what we need for the location that we have. So if we have a community garden, 
then we would need to bioremediate because there's lead in the soil. That's the problem. The solution is bioremediation, which then takes us and, and they're like, what's that? But that takes us into a conversation of bio, bio, bioremediation, talking about John Todd, talking about how you can use fungi and all kinds of things to clean water and soil. So it's always a problem solution frame. And it's also, so I think that they like problem solving, children like problem solving, and also permaculture is a whole systems design approach, but children are really whole systems thinkers. They start to teach, they are taught to silo when they're in junior high and high school. And then when they get to college, if they're lucky, they're taught to be whole systems thinkers again. So what's great about having permaculture in high school, especially in 11th and 12th grade, is that they're, it's before they go to school and it's they're already starting to think about what their next steps are. And children, you, you know, generally they want to make a difference. They want to have an impact. They want to know how they can make things better. Like Michael said, they're interested in justice and equality. And the permaculture design course is not for, I'm not trying to create farmers and urban homesteaders. What I'm trying to do is raise awareness, educate, and if, at the very least have conscious eco-citizens who understand what the problem is, what the solutions are, and how they can become civically engaged or active to make and support better decisions that are being made for our communities that's the general frame of how I teach. And also you make it, I had it as a science elective in the STEM department of a high school of 5,000. So the kids generally who come are the ones who are remotely interested in the topic. So when you have them busy and you have them constantly designing all kinds of different sites and then having gallery works where their peers are, re are reviewing their designs, they perk up real fast because they want their peers to think they're cool. They don't care what I think. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Bonita. Of course. And thank you, Lori. Does anyone else have a question for, for Monica and Cassandra? Roberta. Roberta. Hi, I'm Monica, this is great. I have been a ecology um, educator in the public schools for about, 30 years, I was an itinerant ecology, mostly a lake ecology, which is connected to everything else. But um, I'm now working with an organization that is uh, has a broader perspective, and I'm actually um, serving as their bioregional coordinator. We're going to be working with um, schools. Maine, I live in the state of Maine, recently adopted um, a piece of legislation that provides funding for people with um, expertise in matters of climate and um, sustainable living and sustainable economies and those kinds of things to interact with the teachers at the schools. So at this level, we're just talking about professional development. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I have always been, like you said, an experiential uh, uh, educator. Like I believe in project-based, place-based, student-centered um, education. And um, so we're going to be doing that through a climate lens. But as as you have just so rightly said, that permaculture is one of the solutions to mm -hmm. um, the climate the crisis that we're experiencing. And the fact that most students in most schools, especially public schools, they don't have um, the uh, capacity to take uh, the students out to field sites on a regular basis across the board. But most schools have land, uh, grounds, and a garden is always a great place for them to learn all of these concepts. And so I wonder if you could just tell me, because I'm, I'm just really interested in this. When you're um, speaking, you said you start with your students with the design, and you saw, showed pictures of them designing designing a garden do you I, I'd love to know how you actually present that activity do you say like in the beginning design the your garden? yeah design your dream garden dream about what your garden would look like put it down on paper or do you give them some guidance up front I just 
Yeah. Anything about I, the process, I will I very like. I will very quickly tell you how it works. So you um you have everybody introduce themselves, they say if they have any gardening experience, if they've grown anything, and then you're like, okay, great. So I'm really curious what you know about gardening and farming. Can you please share it with me? I'm gonna write down if you had a dream farm or garden, what would it look like? And I'll write it down. I fill up the board with what they know and then invite them to take this and use it to populate your design. Don't worry about what it looks like. We're permaculture designers, not botanical illustrators. A circle is a cherry. That's it. Don't stress it. And and then, and I said, use symbols, whatever. And then I let them go for it. We present them, we talk about them. And then I'm like, wonderful work. Now, let's talk about a particular kind of design. It's called permaculture design. And it's rooted in ethics. And we have guiding design principles that are based on how nature designs itself. And it comes with a toolbox. Let's begin. And that's how we do it. Does that help? Very, very helpful. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I think that the big thing is for them to just do without being worried about making a mistake. I just want mm -hmm. them to do it. Mm -hmm. Because it's all right. What they did is right. But now let's talk about something more specific. And I'm mm -hmm. glad that you brought up professional development because my big vision is the K through 12 curriculum, but the high school curriculum being the PDC, the permaculture design course year long, 130 hours, but it's also professional development and coaching and mentoring for the teachers who are going to teach the course. So I, they'll get their certificate while they're teaching the course. They'll get their permaculture design certificate. And I think that that is the way that we are going to be able to spread this like wildfire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's eight, eight Oh one right now. And oh, I just want to have us kind of switch gears a little bit. And sure. I, we're going to send folks into, into small great breakout groups for just a few minutes to, to just in, to imagine so let's imagine that every high school in the nation had, with science electives had a permaculture design course. What, what would the world look like? How would the world be different if every high school in the nation had a permaculture design course? So I'm going to send us all into breakout groups just for a quick five minute chat and, and then we'll come back together and, and share some of our thoughts. All right, here we go of little nuggets of of what this looks like what this amazing world with a pdc in every high school what this world looks like what do you think i'm really curious Would anyone like to share i could try to offer a sh quick summary of ours sure Hi. thank you uh the public school system is on one hand behind the curve sometimes broken and um, perhaps educating the teachers will have more of an effect sometimes in trying to get permaculture into the curriculum, which leads to the fact that private schools, charter schools and other educational programs are often good laboratories for trying to go full on with like, integrating permaculture into the curriculum fully mm. that's my mm. attempt and you guys can tell me of uh, to synthesize what we covered i don't think it was that complete though that's you got a thumbs up over there <laughs> any other highlights from other folks Looks like Carrie's gonna talk. <laughs> well, I have to say, I, I feel like it's almost the, the opposite. Uh, so Camille, uh, there's two Camilles here, but the Camille who's 
or there was earlier another one, but um, Camille uh, that's here with me actually works with me and we're, we're sort of just, you know, kind of work in our little corner of uh, <laughs> in Sudbury, Ontario uh, and um, are actually working on kind of developing some programming for we uh, the organization we work for has been um, a nonprofit organization has been developing food food forests in the city um, with Bonita's actually was our, our design coach um, oh, back, uh, oh my goodness seven years ago now that we were starting oh my gosh. to yeah, that's that, ridiculous yeah, I know. Um, and, uh, but yeah, and so we're, we're just, we've kind of done little bits over the years, but we're kind of doing a little bit of a, a more uh, advanced project, like focusing a little bit more on it right now with a particular grant we got to develop some videos and um, work with schools. And uh, so, yeah, I think I, 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 you know, never really thought about like given the big picture, like it's sort of, we're just trying to kind of, do our own little thing in our own little city um it's it's very cool to hear about like the idea of trying to like bring this in a, on a big scale to the whole country and hopefully our country as well <laughs> but uh oh definitely but, um, but yeah it was sort of yeah it, it I, I can't I guess I can't I can't really say I don't know I I I can only think it, it can only be good even though um, as um, I think Richard was pointing out, having um, more experience working with high school students than us, um, that you know, there's, it's you're you're gonna the public school system. You're you're dealing with a lot of um, a lot of things that uh, you're not necessarily gonna make the impact that you're hoping for on every every single one. And I, I always think, like honestly, when we go out and do something with a school class or a a group of kids and one or two kids you can tell you've like got them interested and to me that that's that, that's what matters like I can't ever picture that an entire school class is going to be listening to me the whole time and <laughs> get them excited and tell me afterwards that they thought it was the best thing ever um so I kind of think on that big scale over the a whole country or continent you know if you have just that kind of critical mass of numbers of people that are going to going to have a, a, a different perspective than mm. you could think but I, I would love to respond to that so a couple of things I want to say is one they don't tell you it's the best class ever this is what you end up hearing <laughs> um hey how was that for you he's like it was cool <laughs> <laughs> so you got to learn to translate one yeah. And then too, I had this really cool young woman. She was like a super soccer star in, in my course. And the assistant principal who was head of the science department, STEM department came up and said, hey, I was just talking to Amelia and she was telling me about the tropical design she did for you. And I was like, am I in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> she was like, no, she's never been into science. But, mm. she's, but she has coconuts and these pretty flowers that are look really weird, but she likes them. And I'm all, mm. did she say that to me? No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But my point is the way that you hear it is different, mm. right? And um, when it's an elective, they're still opting in. That's the important thing is you, you're you opting in mm. and you're not talking the whole time. The concepts are delivered in the way I do it. The concepts are delivered in 15 to 20 minutes and then they're doing stuff. Mm -mm. So, and they have things that will help them do the activities. Like it comes with the curriculum has, I'm doing it right now in my permaculture design lab. We've got handouts, we've got resources, we've got them, I've got them researching. I'm like, uh, I, I lie. I don't know what the medicinal benefits of time are. Can you look it up on your phone? And then they look it up and they're like, oh, I didn't know that it did this. And I was like, so is it culinary and medicinal or they're like, yeah, it's both. I'm like, hey, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. You get them, you get them thinking and you get them engaged in all these different ways. So that's something that I think that teachers can definitely do. And it's also, honestly, I don't know you, but you could do it too. It's a big part is being able to watch someone do it and then do it. 
and then try and model it and then just believe and yourself and in the kids a lot of it will be helped by having a really good curriculum by someone who's already gone through it and then you know you use it and you know this has been tried and tested and true and then you can follow a path just like any teacher that's that's what I hope that is it's not a hope it's what I'm doing and it's what I will continue to do the Monica this curriculum I want this to happen oh it's gonna happen so tell us please tell us how can we how can we support you in this big vision so you have you're working on this curriculum how can folks how can folks help you and support you at this at this stage in your in your work in your journey okay so um tell us about about the campaign yeah so what I've been doing is I've been I like I said I've been in the classroom a lot and in a lot of different capacities and in a lot of different schools and dealt with different administrators dealt with different teachers Richard's not wrong on the whole and what he's saying would be the obstacles to being to getting this into public schools. Richard and I have had conversations about this already offline. So um, yes, that is true. But what is also true is that you have outliers always. There are always progressives. Mm-hmm. There's always somebody who's willing to take a risk and show it, show mm-hmm. and be the demonstration site. Much like farming, there was a farmer who is willing to take the risk set up a demonstration site then everybody else comes to look at his farm and go why you have so much food and that's what we're looking for right so those are the people that i've been identifying are the administrators who are willing to take the risk so the idea is that in order to write this curriculum it's a really big endeavor it's about 1500 hours of writing and that's everything right because we have the advisory council the school teachers who will look at it and say yes align it to standards and all the things so it's like a really big project and then the graphic designer if you think about what it would take to get a finished curriculum that I can hand you it's a big project so what I'm thinking is um between the curriculum writers, the graphic designers and everyone. And this is, um, I'm just launching a six month fundraiser where I am tapping my network and I'm reaching out to donors, big and small, lots and lots of people. And to do the high school PDC and the summer camp, which is an elementary and the teacher training, I'm thinking like the budget right now is 95,000, which in the scheme of budgets and in the scheme of this work, I've been told is grossly below what it should be, but I think that it's completely doable and it's gonna happen. And I'm telling everybody about it so that the word can spread and the people who want to invest in this vision of the future for our kids are gonna come. And whether it's sharing the fundraiser where it's telling people about these concepts and these ideas, and you're like, I see this need, I wish we had this thing. These are all the different ways that we can help, mm. right? I'm willing to spearhead this. I'm willing to to organize and coordinate and 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 do all of it because I've already been doing it, right? My summer camp is a 130 hour curriculum. It's 40 kids. It's a free summer camp, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and it covers design, DIY. Um, food is medicine, herbs is medicine. It's like big, big, big. And I can make that into elementary curriculum and creating units. So I have a lot of that kind of stuff, but the high school PDC is different because that's going to require tests for it to be in a public school. We need tests, we need rubrics, we need labs, we need a design booklet. We need so many things. I know what's needed but I need to be able to have the time and the resource. I can make the time. I'm willing to make the time. That's not a problem. We definitely just need the resources to make it happen. So I would love for you to have that curriculum. That would be amazing. And then you could feel confident. Carrie, I need my glasses. Carrie, you could feel confident (laughs) because you would know that it's happening, Mm. right? Because it's been done. 
Oh, and I have a high school where I'll be doing it this fall. They've already said they'll sign on. So I have a lot of work to do. So Monica, can you walk us through your the crowdfunding page and how people can donate? Oh, sure. Sure. So right now we started, we have we have two, we have two options. There's a what's do it you called? want me? Do you want to share a screen? Or do you sure. want me to share screen? Yeah, okay. I'll do it. It's um Indiegogo. Let me let me do this. Let me just pull it up. Great. I will pull it up. And um and then the other thing that I was going to say about this is that the other thing that I was going to say about this is that when we're looking at the idea is that this fall, I will show that, you know, it can be done. I will do it at the same school that I've been working at since 2014. Um, I have another school in Harlem with a very progressive um, principal who is uh, who's also very interested in the course. So um, I would work with the teacher throughout the school year. I'm just, um, I'm signing in. It signed me out. That's why I couldn't just share screen. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, why does it keep asking me for a verification code? That's so odd. That's not going to work. Two-factor authentication is the bane of my existence. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh -huh. Richard. All of ours. So true. I know. I, I, I am like, because I'm new to GoFundMe, um, I've never done like a, this is my pi premiere first run at something like this. That's, oh, there it is. Okay, we're, here we go. Monica. your fundraisers. So I'll be uh, adding to this, but I'll just show you what I have right now. Um, this is one of my high school classes here in Queens. They were really, really good, y'all. They were like really creative and um, they took pride in their work and uh, they they were just great. So this is this is uh, the GoFundMe and the name of it is uh, preparing. Let's prepare youth to inherit the earth, because I say that a lot. If kids are to inherit the earth, are they ready? No, they're not. Can we help get them ready? Yes, we can. So um mm. So I just talk a little bit about what we're what we're planning, like what what it would all be broken down, because in order to get them one, the first thing is to do it. Then once we do it, the this next year, next school year, we can work out some, you know, if anybody here has written curriculum, you understand that you you do it and you work out some kinks and then um, you can do it more. And then we would need to get the word out to start getting it. But that's where the marketing communications would come in um, to get people to get the word out so we can get more people. I really see a lot of interest on my end, just because that's something that I'm that's a world that I'm in. I see a lot of interest and I think it'll be a lot easier. And for the people who are educators I think some of you guys consider yourself to be educators. I know Richard, so I know him already. I know that he is. And um, for others that are on the call, Cassie, definitely, Michael. Um, for the people who are educators, what we're looking at is that there is nothing that brings together all the disparate pieces. 
permaculture brings together ecology, agriculture, design, and sustainability. This is a vehicle, it's an interdisciplinary vehicle that doesn't exist outside of permaculture. So in this car, we can add a lot of stuff and we can introduce children to a lot of things. And that's really all this is, is. it's an introduction and then they decide which avenue they want to go down. I, if you've done a permaculture design course and if you've kept in touch with the people in your course, you know that they have gone on to do so many things. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, Bonita, you've taught PDCs. You know that your students have gone on to do what Carrie, Carrie, Carrie who else are you working with? Is it Camille? Cool. Hi, Camille. <laughs> Thanks for the good work you guys are doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like Carrie and Camille, like, um, you know, I just would so many different ways that people uh, approach this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that what I said earlier is true. We want to raise awareness and we want to educate. And all of us are doing this already every day. So I want to do it on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. And it's a very small number considering the impact of what this could look like, mm -hmm. because I've seen children start community projects where they're planting butterfly corridors in Queens. I've seen them start composting programs. I've seen them go on to do environmental engineering in college because I've been doing this long enough now that they're in college. Mm -hmm. I've seen them and my small ways I've seen them become influenced mm. and the PDC is a vehicle for me can be a vehicle of transformation and decision making and it gives them a lens through which to look at life an mm. actual lens and those are the kinds of things that I want my nieces and nephews to have the opportunity to do. I love that so much. Monica. And all the Thank other you. little kids and all the other big kids too. That's awesome. So if, so if folks, if folks here would like to support the crowdfunding campaign, or if you know of, if you know of someone, an organization or a, um, a private donor who is wanting to support a beautiful project like this, please, please tell them about this project. I will put, Monica, are you, um, so I'm putting into the, the chat, the link on your website to the donation page. Okay. And thanks. just, and actually, so Monica, just to clarify, the yeah. second button on the donation page, the regular oh, donation yeah, you... is not linking the regular, the regular donations button is not yet linking to the GoFundMe page. It's linking to a broken PayPal page. So you, if you know can what? Look at that. Let's yeah, actually, I'm really glad that you said that. So I'm going to go there directly and I'm just going to very quickly explain what this is. So essentially um, what's happening here is that if people need a tax donation letter, then Pan has graciously offered to be, if you need a tax donation letter, um, then, and, then PAN is my fiscal sponsor. They've offered to be my fiscal sponsor, which I'm so happy. And I'm from the Northeast. So to me, it's a very special. And then if you do not need a tax donation letter, then this is going to be connected to our business, our, you know, I say business, nonprofit, um, PayPal account. That's what that's going to be. So um, that's all it is. Thank you, Marco. Is there time for a quick question? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if I were to go to someone and ask them about funding this project, mm -hmm. do you have people already lined up? Like, let's say I have a neighbor, his son goes to a private school. Is their private school ready to incorporate this now, a year from now? Like if we're approaching people, Mm -hmm. What do we tell them? Do you have the graphic designers or do you need that money before? I know you've already been doing it, 
and you're going to continue. Yeah, but I think it's really different that if I'm up there teaching when I know everything, when I have to write it down so somebody else can do it. Right. So what I have is my stuff. What I need to do is write it so somebody else can teach it. That is what I do not have. I know, but do you need the money before you begin that? Or are you starting as you, if if I were to approach someone and they say, well, what's the timeline or what's a little more specific of the plan? What, what I would think it, that if you're would, approaching a private school, I'm going to guess that you would want them to, uh, per, to license the curriculum and, and coach and get coaching for their teacher. Is that what you would? be approaching a private school for? Uh, you know, I don't know. Let's say it's oh, okay. someone not even involved in a school, just someone who cares about permaculture and wants to fund this. And they'll yeah. say, well, what's the plan? Is it a one-year plan, a five-year plan? Like, No, it's a two-year plan. And the 95 is for this first year, which is finishing the curriculums and getting the, the, the teacher mentoring program developed and evolved and all that. So no, so no, I just wanted to make sure that I understood the second part. I got the first part. I We are looking for resources. Uh, finding a graphic designer is not a hard thing. That's, that's, I already have an agency that I am in contact with. That's not hard. Um, what we're looking for are the resources to, for me to allocate basically half of my life because I do teach these other things I have to rearrange my life and allocate a big chunk of my time to do this work so do you need all the money before you get started or you can keep going as the money comes in I'm going to I'm going to be doing this for the fundraising is happening for six months I will start as I can and as money comes in then I will okay. do what I can I okay. Perfect. really confident that it's going to happen. Yep. And um, yeah. The only other thing I'd like to share a week ago, it's a drop off topic, but a week ago I was at a chestnut festival. I know two people doing this now and it drew a very much bigger crowd than they expected. And someone said to me, if we want people to eat different foods, we have to expose them to it because That's they've never tasted it. So okay. another thing that people are doing are making apple cider, you know, but even when we were working against the, it was something to do with children and asthma or breathing. And what they did in Brooklyn, they had a huge event with kite flying. So they got the families out, they got the children having fun, and then they were able to talk to the adults. Mm -hmm. Do your children have respiratory issues? So I was just wondering if there's a way to draw a crowd that's fun and music and food. And maybe more people would get informed. Yeah. Um, but that's another big undertaking. So I'm not trying to add more to your. <laughs> no, just so you know, I will be doing webinars. This was my first one like this. Um, okay. I will be doing them for the Permaculture Institute of North America, our professional trade association next month. And I will be doing one for OSU in January. I'm pretty much tapping like my network of everyone that I know, like I said, I've been working like nose to the grindstone forever. And now I have to come up and say, Hey, this is what we're doing. So you will definitely, if you're following us, follow us on social media, uh, sign up for our newsletter. I will be announcing all the upcoming webinars. I'll be announcing what we're doing with our donation, how the donation is going. So definitely follow along on the journey with us and just tell your friends, you never know. You never know. I did a gardening event and I had a young woman working with me. We had a great time. I didn't know her from anybody. Next thing I know, two weeks later, I got a $3,000 check. Apparently her family had a foundation. Also, have you? are you planning to apply for grants? I finally this summer did a site visit to my friend's permaculture farm. They're doting all the food and all their medicinal herbs, but they're getting grants so that they're able to do that uh to donate to people who would not normally have access to those foods or medicinal plants most of our work is grant funded the work that i the summer camp that i do is free and the work that i do in spanish harlem is also grant funded to develop curriculum grants are very tricky 
And um, if I see something about developing curriculum, then sure. But that's not generally how they're framed. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else have any questions? No. I want to say thank you all. Thank you, Bonita. I really appreciate you. Thank you for coming. And um, I didn't get to hear because, you know, we ran out of time, but what all of you are doing in life, and I really would love to know. Um, and I just from the little bit that I've heard, it sounds like people are doing some really cool stuff. So thank you for the work you're doing in the world. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you all for being here. Thank you, Cassandra, for being here and being part of the conversation. And thank you, Monica, for your beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work in the world. And I really just my I have such a big hope for this project. I, I want to see this. I want to see these these seeds just spread across the continent. So I, I will when I follow when I said it, what yes. It, I said the yes. time is now. I think yes. we're really ripe for it. Yes, definitely. Yes, yes, yes. Anita, thank you so much for your questions. The way you organized mm. every moment of this hour and a half was oh, cool. Yay! Oh, on, on, on Oh, thank, thank you, you Marie. I appreciate Beautiful that very job. much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So when I send out the follow-up email, I can send a link to the recording for those who had to leave early and for those who signed up and couldn't actually make the call this evening. And also um, we'll get the link. I'll include Monica's contact information, your social handles, as That's well great. as the link and to the donation. As well page. as the OSU video. Yes, I I put that in the in the ah, chat, and I will I'll, definitely I'll put check that, out yes. that OSU video. It's yeah. so cool in bioremediation. Yeah, Gil Lopez. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome Just, man. Thank you all for being here. Everybody. Please help spread the word about this project. And we just, yeah, we yeah. would love to see these. We would love to, we would love to see these seeds spread far and wide and find homes in the right places. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for your care. Yeah. Bye, Richard. Bye. Monica, will you stay for a moment? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Monica, is it ever possible to come to one of the places where you're doing your work and spend some time with you, watching you? Uh sure. Yeah. 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 What what do you what I do a lot of different work. So which I, I don't know. Oh, I'm not yeah. going to take okay. the time now. I just, <laughs> okay. my heart, my heart connects with you. I'm going to share awesome. your information. Yeah. Um, I have some people near where I live who are working with children. Um, one of the things I saw Andrew Faust, you, you yeah. know, Andrew, right? He, everybody showed up at the chestnut festival. It was spontaneous. We didn't know, um, Joan Ewing and Wilton Duckworth oh, and known is where I started. Yeah, and 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 Eric from Black Creek, who I just found out sells trees. Um mm -hmm. and I just lost my train of thought. Shoot. Well, you were talking about Joan and Andrew Faust. Yeah, but um hmm. So I don't know exactly, but um, and some of the local people actually are working with children doing a farming and homeschooling classes on the land. Yeah. So I did lose my train of thought, but I just thought just to spend a little more time with you and get to, oh, I know what I wanted to say about Andrew Faust. Mm -hmm. There's something called Impact 100. My friend who had an edible schoolyard got funding from them, which is how I learned about it. And it's not for what you're doing. But what I said to Andrew, I wake up every day or before I go to sleep, how can we fund the people? Impact 100 is 100 people come together, they donate $1,000, and then they have a process where they give money to certain things. And it doesn't have to be that big, but there are people who have money. So every day, I'm just trying to figure out who can we reach that has the money? Um, one group had a dinner, one permaculture class in Philly, and the food was donated and people applied for micro grants for like drippage irrigation or a rain barrel. Mm -hmm. But your work is so significant. So 
I will be talking to people. There are no promises, but I just, you will be in my heart every day as long as I'm alive. The two of you, you did. It was just. Oh, I'm so glad. I feel like I wasted so much time with the, you know, all the testifying I did that came to nothing, but you're, you're having a sign and, and my interest in lifestyle medicine and hearing now that the doctors are, they said, we don't want to train them in nutrition. We want them to be in a classroom with hands-on, with learning um, how to prepare the foods. Yeah. So it's all connected. That's true. We do that. And um, gracias, mi placer. You've given me hope. I need a lot of it. Good. <laughs> and, Good. And I won't keep talking, but no, we, we shall see. You. Thank you okay. so much. Bless you both. Oh, thank you, Cassie. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Lori. Ah. Lori, we're still oh, recording. Cassie, you're still now, here. Lori, we're still recording right now. Is it okay if we include this last few couple of minutes in the recording when we when we post it? Absolutely. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Far Thank and you. wide. May, amazing. May it be Thank so. You. Awesome. Thank you. Much gratitude to you. Yeah. Lovely to meet you. Ah, sí. Okay, hasta la próxima. Gracias. Hasta la próxima. Adios, Lori. Let's call on the ancients to come in. And yeah, bless. No, I'm with you on that. I yeah. am blessed. I am led. I am guided. Yes. This is going to happen. We're working mm -hmm. to preserve 20 acres of forest in Chappaqua, New York. That's a sacred ceremonial indigenous site. So we're we're in the middle of it, too. But it, it's mm -hmm. all connected. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Laura. Much gratitude. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Oh mm -hmm. my God. Wow. Okay. I have like pains in my heart. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was intense. We'll stop the recording.